This is the second in a series of recordings on two-level, uh, or what we often call two to the k factorial designs. And again, you should have read the notes, uh, two-level designs, part one, before watching this video. In the previous video, we talked about the analysis of two to the k factorials. We talked about the importance of using um, the mean square error, that is our measure of noise in the response, as a basis for deciding which of the experimental effects in our experiment might be real and which might be happenstance. That is, if the effect we measure is essentially no greater than noise, and noise would simply indicate how much a response could change on its own if we stood there and did nothing. There's no explanation for the noise, it just happens at random in the system. So once I know how much noise there is via the mean square error and the root mean square error, I can use things like um, one sample t-tests to decide which of the effects might be significantly different than zero. However, sometimes designs are not replicated. And there are valid reasons in some cases. Most often, it's the experimenters do not understand the importance of replication in measuring the level of noise in the response. So in this section, I'm going to talk about rep analysis of unreplicated designs. This material could have been put at any number of places in the notes. Since this is an important topic, but I've chosen this as the point to first introduce the concept. And we're going to base it on an experiment. This was an experiment to study fire retardancy of children's sleepwear. Notice if you'll, there are four factors, A, B, C, and D, type of factor, uh, fabric, type of fire retardant treatment, whether or not the material had been laundered, once or not at all. We certainly hope that factor does not end up being important. And D equals the fire retardancy method. Basically what they do, they take a long strip of the material, they light one end of it with something like a blowtorch, and then they have a timer and they measure how much material is charred in a given time period. And it depends on the test method. You can actually find YouTube videos showing the test. Uh, there are standards for it. But essentially, our response is going to be inches of charred material. And I've actually forgotten what the time period is. Um, but again, the response is simply how much material was burned. And the file is called fireretardant.jump. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to jump and talk about the experiment. Now, notice in the data table, I'm just going to extend it a bit for you. Okay. The columns A, B, C, and D are to the, the design. This is a 2 to the 4 factorial. There are 16 unique combinations. And notice each of the 16 combinations was performed. For reference, I've added the additional columns for the effects that need to be estimated. In general, you will never see these in your data table. These are generated internally by the software once you start putting interactions in your model. So these columns that are highlighted are necessary in order to estimate the interaction effects. And remember, an effect is nothing more than the average of the response at the high setting minus the average of the effect at the low setting. So basically, experimental effects in two-level factorials are mathematically very simple to calculate. It's just the difference in the average high minus the average low. Okay. So we want to analyze the design, but again, notice there's no replication. So I actually have no basis for estimating experimental error. 
is every trial is unique. Nothing has been replicated. So I'm going to go again to the Analyze menu, Fit Model. I'm going to highlight my four experimental effects in the Select Columns window. And under Macros, I'm going to select Full Factorial. Okay. And the response is inches of material that has been charred. And the emphasis is uh, automatically set to effect screening. Okay. So when I open the table, I'm going to close some of this for now. I'm going to show you the ANOVA table okay, and the parameter estimates table. Notice for the error, there's zero degrees of freedom. Every observation was used to estimate an effect in the model. Essentially, I have 16 unknowns in 16 equations, and that's something we can do. We can estimate it. But in uh, statistics, that's not a good estimate. In other words, in a deterministic system without noise, estimating 16 unknowns and 16 equations is um, something that can be done, and it's valid. In statistical analyses, we suffer from a problem. I've estimated all of these effects, but which of them are real and which might be noise? I don't really know because I have no measure of noise in the system. Nothing was replicated. Now if you look at some of these effects like the four-way interaction, the effect is pretty small, but what we need is some way of trying to estimate which of these effects might be real. Okay. So I'm going to show you some uh, approaches, some uh, tools that are used to analyze unreplicated designs although it's simply uh, better to just have included at least some replication. So under the main report men menu to the left of response, where it says factor profiling, I'm sorry, I meant effect screening, I'm going to pick something called a normal plot. And I'm going to pick a version, call it half normal. Okay. And this is described in the notes, so again, you should read them. But here's the basic idea. Under the null hypothesis, okay, remember under the null hypothesis, we assume every term in our model is zero. By the way, I don't really care about the intercept, so I'm only going to worry about the experimental effects of A down through the four-way interaction. Under the null hypothesis, they're all zero. So if I do a normal plot, of the estimated coefficients, and they're all normal with a mean zero, they should all plot on a straight line. Okay. But what if some of them are not? What if some of them are actually significantly non-zero? Well, they shouldn't fit on the straight line, the reason being their true value, underlying value, isn't zero. So this is an old method called the normal plot method. It goes back to the 1950s, believe it or not. And a man named Cuthbert Daniel, who first figured out the idea, he's on the statistical all-name team. But notice, Jump is pointing out there are some effects that do seem to plot off of the line. So this gives us an idea that at least some of these effects, and by the way, Effect A leads the way, but some of these may be significantly um, non-zero. The question is, we still don't know where to begin in terms of removing effects. Well, there's a method, and again, I am not going to delve into the details. I'd like you to read about them in the notes. Something called Lent's method, and Lent is a statistician who's still at the University of Iowa who quite a number of years ago attacked this problem of unreplicated design and basically what he did he came up with a method where we select the number of coefficient estimates that are most likely non that are most likely non-zero 
okay, the big ones, we remove them, and then using some statistical theory, he estimates the overall experimental error from the remaining coefficients. So in our case, we'd remove some of these big coefficient estimates, and then uh, again, I will not get into the theory. Again, I ask you to read the notes. We estimate the standard error from the essentially the coefficients that plot along the line. And using his method, okay, we get what is called the pseudo standard error. And the word pseudo should stand out in your mind. This is based on a lot of assumptions about the coefficients. But it is an estimate of the standard error of each coefficient. Okay? And it turns out we can use that to do what are called pseudo t-tests. Okay? And again, pseudo is there for a word. These are approximate tests based on statistical theory. It assumes the coefficients under the null hypothesis have a normal distribution with mean zero. Okay. And overall the normal distribution part we can justify with the central limit theorem because all coefficient estimates are actually based on averages. But determining which ones are really zero and which are not is somewhat arbitrary. So notice I have this table of pseudo t-tests and what we typically do, we look through the table and we look for effects with the largest p-values. And we also assume that the larger interactions are least likely to be significant. So what I would do at this point is I take a look at the effect of the four-way interaction I've said before we typically don't believe four-way interactions exist and I'm just going to remove it from the model. So I'm going to leave this display open and I'm going to go back to my model dialog window and I'm going to remove the four-way interaction and refit the model. Well remember the fundamental concept of ANOVA. The sum of squares total equals the sum of squares model plus the sum of squares error. If I take a term out of the model, then the variation due to that term is automatically reassigned to error. In other words, every observation has to be in the sum of squares model calculation or the sum of squares error. So now I click Run, okay, and let me come over, and I'm going to primarily focus on the ANOVA table. Notice on the right-hand side, there is now one degree of freedom for error. And what was that one degree of freedom? Well, it turns out it was the four-way interaction. So now I have a test uh, for um, the significance of the terms, but remember it's a very low power test based on an assumption that the four-way interaction truly had a zero effect. Well, what would I do next? Well, typically we'd look through things like three-way interactions. And again, higher order terms are least likely to be significant than lower order terms. So I might drop the three-way interaction ABC. Okay. So I'm going to close this window and again go back to the model dialog window. Remove the four-way interaction and the ABC three-way interaction. Okay, and run the model. And again, I'm going to focus on the ANOVA table. Now there are two degrees of freedom for error. Again, based on the assumption the two terms I removed have zero effect. Then when we do this, we take a look at um, 
three-way interactions and notice the next one would probably be BCD and then ACD. You need to be careful. These are very low degree of freedom tests and they are making some strong assumptions. You should only remove one term at a time because these p-values can actually change dramatically in the early stages of this process because they're based on such low degrees of freedom the estimated mean square error can change dramatically. Okay. So my next step would actually be to go back and remove the BCD interaction. And I'm not going to do the whole thing for you right now. So I go back to model, the model dialog and I'm going to remove BCD. Okay. So I've removed it. I'm going to refit the model now there are three degrees of freedom. What I'm going to show you is if I continue this process, what you'll find in the end is that no term involving C shows up as significant. Neither C by itself or C as a part of interactions. So I'm now going to fit a full factorial model in just three factors. So if you look at our table, okay, if I cross out column C, just remove it, then this looks like a replicated factorial in A, B, and D. The A, B, and D design would have eight runs, but since I had factor C in the model, there are 16 runs. But if I take C out of the model, I'm crossing it off. I'm saying C has no effect whatsoever. Okay. So if I fit my model, let's see, here we go, with just these three factors, again, the response is inches. Okay. Notice there are eight degrees of freedom for error. These come from the eight terms I removed involving factor C. And again, I have made a very hard assumption that all those eight terms are noise. There is no real effect. In other words, the true underlying effect of those eight terms was zero. That's a pretty hard assumption. But at least I'm able to do or justify some type of analysis. So I look at my final model, and by the way, notice the three-way interaction appears significant. So I'm going to keep the full factorial model in A, B, and D. And I wanted to illustrate to you while I'm at it what it means to have a three-way interaction. So I'm going to go down to the prediction profiler, click on the profiler, Okay, and then one of the options okay, is the interaction profiler. Okay. okay, what this is is a dynamic visualization of interactions and it is linked to the prediction profiler. So let's take a look at, for instance, the interaction of A and D. So if there's a three-way interaction, the nature of the AD interaction should change with B. That's what a three-way means. A two-way interaction changes its characteristics as a third factor changes. Okay. So I'm going to change B. And you can see, indeed, the interaction changes. And in fact, you might be able to see it even easier in the lower left-hand corner. Okay. Notice when B is low, A and D barely interact. When B is high, they strongly interact. So that is what is meant by three-way interactions. They're not common, but they do occasionally occur, and they can cause a great deal of uh, difficult to predict behavior in a physical system.
Okay. So in this approach, we've used Lent's method. Again, you should refer to the notes on the mathematical details to perform a series of pseudo tests to remove terms from the model that then allow us to estimate experimental error. And in this particular case, we have concluded that a model, a full factorial model in A, B, and D is our best model, has the significant effects. And remember what factor C is. The material was either washed once or not at all. We would certainly hope that the fire retardancy of children's sleepwear would not be gone in a single washing. That simply would be useless. And indeed, it does not show up as significant. And that concludes this video.